come to the last chapter of this great book, and we're going to do a little bit of reflection for a moment as we notice these first century believing Jews <clears throat> that were about to defect from Christ. We also call that defection from the faith, tone per stone, the embodiment of the teaching of Christ. The temple and Jerusalem had not been destroyed at this time. The church itself had assembled in the upper room and they were also assembling on the temple mount. During the persecution leading up after the Saul, after, uh, because of Saul of Tarsus, after the death of, of Stephen, persecution became a way of life. I gave you verses there that you can look at those verses. With the believing Jews connected with the church at Jerusalem, so we have to keep our study in context and not wander off on subject matters. This is a reason for this is the reason what is brought out in this chapter. Preachers go to Hebrews and they establish sermons I call subject matters. And and what's listed here are good subjects to consider. But we keep on talking about context, context, context. Well, if we keep Hebrews in context, then what we're doing is we're looking at believing Jews who have embraced Christ by faith, okay? And they're under extreme difficulties. We call it persecution. Not only were they being persecuted from the Romans because the emperor of Rome was a god, they were now being persecuted from their families. And they were being separated and they were being literally, a lot of them ended up in prison because that's what uh, Saul of Tarsus was doing. He was literally out against anyone who presented this Christ as their savior. And so the marching orders get rid of them. Get rid of them. And so we're, we're dealing with a time span that when you study Israel, those people went through terrible, terrible, difficult times even before the temple was destroyed. Okay? And so we have to deal with context and put ourselves in the situation to understand. I have a book, <clears throat> it's written, it's called 100 Nutshells of Jewish History. And it, it, it literally unfolds a lot of the, 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 the trials that the Jewish people were going through. If you ever read Josephus, Josephus was a historian and he was the one that wrote about the siege of Jerusalem and the Romans coming in and what these people were going through. So here you, you not only have the Jewish people going through a lot of difficulty, now before, the, before Rome comes in to destroy Jerusalem and the temple, they are going through havoc maintaining their faith. The problem is we don't have persecution today like they had. We, we don't have it. There is a freedom that people have in Christ now, and through this freedom, they're abandoning Christ. I can't, I don't have enough toes and fingers, and I can almost say hair on my head, of people that I know who have defected from the truth and went into error. I, I don't have enough fingers and toes to count them all. Because every time I turn around, <clears throat> there's a defection going on. Every time a person <clears throat> uh, leaves the church, there, there, there sometimes there's good legitimate reasons, but nine times out of the ten, I just don't believe the way the church believes. And, <clears throat> and so we find the same 
defection. So <clears throat> I've given us a couple lists here that we're going to just scan through before we get to our lesson. The first lesson is looking at the book, okay, and see what we see in the book, one through seven. If you notice that they were drifting from the word. I'm amazed today that a lot of people read a little bit of the Bible and they're all at once they're a scholar. You know, did you know that the Bible says, and they're usually pointing that at a Christian. Don't you know the Bible that you believe in says this? Yeah, they know that. But yet they're still human, they still make mistakes, but when they make mistakes, they repent of that, they turn around and they correct their steps by following Jesus. These who take parts of the Bible and throw them at people don't know how to do that because they've never been saved. And so we have difficulties today. But they were drifting from the Word. They were doubting the Word. They were developing dullness of hearing. They were despising the Word willfully. They were not concerned with their birthright, but yet they wanted the blessing, just like Esau. They were defying the Word, refusing to hear. They were defying their position in the church, the local body of Christ. When an individual makes that spiritual, intellectual decision to identify with Christ in baptism, that is an awesome situation. Because when they come into the church, they're coming into a birthright. We have been made partakers it's called joint heirs, heirs and joint heirs with Christ. We have become partakers of Christ in that inheritance. That's birthright. But people don't care about their birthright. Uh, when you talk about uh, looking at the church's heritage and going back to establish our birthright, people are not interested. They could care less about Baptist heritage. They could, they could care less about Christian heritage. Okay, now listen. When you go under a certain amount of dissatisfaction, you go under persecution like these people, the human flesh takes over. It's called survival mode. Okay? And to go into a survival mode you want to relieve yourself from the pressure that you're under. And so what you're going to do is you're going to adapt carnal thinking to relieve yourself. So, so I'm getting persecution from my family. My family's putting the thumbs down on me because I, I, I'm a Christian. I go to church three times a week. Who believes in that anymore? I go to church three times a week. I'm growing in my grace and, and faith in the Lord. But my family is putting their thumb down on me. So, so what am I going to do to, 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 to make this better? I'm going to lessen my responsibility in going to church. I'm going to, I'm just going to kind of step aside and I'm going to visit my family Sunday afternoon and Sunday night and do things on Wednesday. I'm not going to go to church anymore just on Sunday morning because who, who took, the Bible doesn't say I have to go that often, but the Bible says to forsake not the assembling yourself together as the matter of some is, but much more as you see that day, the day of Christ coming. You see, in 1948, when the nation Israel became a nation, there was a time clock. The nation Israel started moving like the dead bones over in Ezekiel. We're on a short timeline here before Christ comes. From 1948 till now, Christ is so much closer coming than he was back there. Because Israel is well fortified. They have their own military. They have their own cabinet. They're still under Gentile rule to a certain degree. But one day Jesus is going to come and give them full authority again. And that's not very short up the road. And I find very few people are concerned about that because they're not concerned about their 
birthright. Okay? So, go to the second sec section. In chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, they began, they began right by hearing and witnessing the signs and wonders and miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. Clump that in one thought. These people had a relationship with Christ. Number two, they knew the doctrines of Christ. Go over there, Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1. In chapter 3 and verse 14, they, made, they were made partakers of Christ if they held their profession to the end. Six, Hebrews 6, 10, they had, they had been faithful in the works and labors. But... In 5.12, when they should have been teachers, when they should have been teachers, they became dull in hearing, okay, needed to be taught the milk of the word again. Now, aren't we seeing that? And we're not under persecution. Uh, <clears throat> One of the things up at Cologne, my brother Sam was telling me, they can't get teachers. Uh, we're going to try to get our Sunday school going again. Once you lose Sunday school, you're not going to get it back. Why? Because te te teachers don't want to teach anymore. And, and so that in our world, as well as our church, is ha we're having problems. They're having a problem getting workers out there. We have a problem getting teachers. I mean, good teachers. They teach the Word of God. Thank God for those that do step up the plate and are willing to teach. Like Kim over there, she raised her hand, she wants to start a class. See, that, that's, that's a motivation that I feel that comes from the Spirit of God and we need to put people in position to do what the Spirit of God is leading them to do. Okay? So, so these people had this, but they've been to back away and they became so sluggish well, they should have been teachers. They have to have the milk of the word again. Okay? Number six, chapter three and verse 12. They didn't heed, but were led off by an evil heart of unbelief. I have been amazed over the years, even people that I've known for years that's been in the church that are not faithful in the church anymore that ask me questions they already should have, know the answer. Answer, ask me a question they should have already had the answer. <laughs> you see, we, 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 we're, we're falling into the uh, same thing, okay? Because what I'm hearing is why I just, I have a hard time believing that. Uh, well, well, what part of this verse don't you understand? What part of the context do, not, do you not understand? Well, I, I, I don't know the Bible like you know it. <laughs> Don't get me going. Don't get me going, okay? In, in, in 6 and 12, they were sluggish, okay? They were sluggish like Esau, 12, 16, and were selling their birthright with a worldly mind. What, is, what does it mean to sell your birthright? Well, go back to, uh, go back to Jacob and Esau. Esau was the firstborn he had the first privilege of birthright. That when dad died, he would become the, the leader of the family. He would have a double portion of the inheritance. And he would lead the people, not only spiritually, but also morally and intellectually. Okay? When he came back hungry from hunting, <laughs> Jacob got his birthright. Because he wanted this, some of this stew that he had. And he said, well, give me a birthright and I'll give you a bowl. Why? Because of the flesh. Now folks, I don't want to be mean. But preachers sometimes, teachers sometimes, teach good things. But then they teach bad things. The bad things is the warnings we don't want to hear see, in preaching and teaching, there is the positive and also 
the negative. But when, when you come here in this chapter, the writer of this book, I believe, was Paul. There's a lot of arguing about that. Some say it was later. No, because the temple was still there. So, so what, what he's doing now is he's going to say, now wait a minute, you're going through all of this persecution and everything, this is what you need to do. You need to do. The religious ideas were pulling them away from Christ and back to the old Jewish belief system. And now their moral and spiritual endeavorances have fallen on them, and now they, and now they were being tested by persecution, which God allowed. <clears throat> when a believer, especially a church member, because that's what we're talking about here, these are all church people. Okay, these are all church people. They're just not say they're church people. They have embraced, they have identified with Christ, but their doubts and everything are driving them away from Christ. Okay, so 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 we're all there to a certain degree. Uh, so if we're talking about church members, you and I, we have our struggles, but how do we deal with them? Okay, say for instance, somebody comes up to you and just uh, blanketly says something that hurts you. Okay, as God's person, as a member of the Lord's body, walking with Christ, being Christian, what am I to do? They have now offended me, they have now hurt my feelings, so what am I to do? Matthew chapter 18. Go to them. Get it taken care of. If they don't listen to you, take somebody else along with you. Not, not people that will stand where you stand, but stand where the Lord wants them to stand. And if they won't listen to them, take it to the church. And let the church hear it. And if they won't listen to the church, then let them be recognized as a heathen. Do we do that today? And, reason, and, and one of the reasons that we're having a lot of problems in church work is because of that very same thing. Well, he hurt my feet. She hurt my feet. Why did you go see her? Did you go see him? No. You, but you went and talked to another brother or sister in the Lord about it. That, am I correct? So that's the human way. That's the fleshly mind way. So, so in essence, well, if we take the picture that we see in the book of Hebrews, what these were people were doing under extreme persecution and bring it over here that we're not under persecution, we're just lazy, unresponsive children of God not doing what the world wants us to do. Am I correct on that? <laughs> oh, I get any, anything on that one. <laughs> Okay, so, so this, this, is, this is where we are focused as we're looking at these people who are under extreme persecution. I'm talking about church people. I'm talking about believers in Christ. I'm talking about people who have identified themselves with Christ, but their flesh nature is giving them all kinds of problems because they want this pressure released. They don't want this persecution. They, they want their families to love them. They want their families to take care of them. They, they want to have those fellowships with their families. But the family are putting, putting a cloth over their picture and classifying them as dead when they receive Christ as their personal Savior. You see, we, we don't get into this book enough to find out exactly how they felt. If we get into this book and see how they felt and see the, the human side of it and what they were doing to relieve, to relieve themselves from this kind of pressure, then you could understand where this book is coming from. Brother Carson, I, I think one of the things we be able to realize too is we're studying this. These people did not have 66 books. Now, looking back on the mistakes of Ergo and mm -hmm. and like you're saying, we have the word here 
in our presence to show us what mistakes, missed choices, I hate to say mistakes, missed choices that they made in those days and why they went through a lot of things. And we tell the people as we're teaching, as we're preaching, study the Word. But how many people know how to study the Word? We tell them to do it, but how many classes do we have teaching people, here's how you study the Word so you can have the context, mm -hmm. have the full understanding. And I appreciate our young people that show up on Wednesday night. Those guys are really learning and they're really picking a lot of stuff up because they're learning how to study the Bible. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to emphasize that a little bit more, not just study. Yeah. But here's how you study, like you were saying, context, history, mm -hmm. who's speaking, who wrote. I agree with you about Hebrews being the Apostle Paul. If you go back and look at his letters to uh, the Corinthians, so much that you see here is yeah. out there, but people don't study mm -hmm. to find that out. An old preacher told me early in my ministry, early in my Christian life, he said, learn to pick yourself up, put yourself in the Bible, and feel what's going on. Feel what's going on. You learn so much. So that brings us to uh, Hebrews chapter 13. Any comment at this point? So, so if you see these things, what they were going through and what was happening, then you understand more where the human nature was taken over rather than the spiritual nature. Okay, so let's go to our lesson. It says, let brotherly love continue. Okay, now let's stop. When you look at this verse, what do you see? Okay, in context of these Jewish believers, we're looking at Jewish in context, believers who have identified with Christ under extreme persecution, what does he say? What does he say? Let love, what does he say? Let brotherly love continue. Now, now right there, Brother Bob talked about knowing what the Bible is saying. saying about the word here is Philadelphia. Remember one of the churches by the name of Philadelphia, brotherly love? This is talking about a natural love. Now, when I was saved, when you were saved, there was something about you and something about me that we wanted to tell somebody about it. Because we fell in love with the Lord. And we wanted to share what has happened with somebody else because of love. But listen, that was what we call this love. When you go to 2 Peter chapter 1, he says, in verse 5, he said, add to your faith these things. If you look down there, around verse 7 or there, down through there, he says, for you add from brotherly love, charity. Now listen, it's not an easy thing to do to move from the natural to the godly. Now, now, listen to me, please. To move from the natural. Now, the natural means this. I'm fond of you. I, I, I respect you. I care for you. I like being around you, but if you hurt my feelings, I'm not going to talk to you the rest of my life. Okay, that's his love. Now, now, what is he saying? He says, let brotherly love continue. He said that love that generated from you, let it continue and allow the Spirit of God to shed blood in your heart God's kind of love. That, that what you find yourself, you're going from the fondness to the treasure. Now rather than just having a fondness of somebody, you treasure them. Even a person who doesn't like you. Why? Because that person, the Lord would like to save. You know, there are a lot of opportunities that have slipped by our grips that somebody that needs to be saved because of our pouting and because of our anger, we have literally blew it and pushed them away. Are you following me? All right, I want to, I want to show you something here. Turn your Bible with me uh, to 1 Corinthians 
1 Corinthians chapter 6. Again, Bob said we need to know our Bible. Uh, in chapter 6, uh, Paul makes mention in verse 9 and verse 10 a bunch of uh, sinners. <laughs> And, and, and when we identify with these sinners, with these sinners in verse nine and ten, we don't want to have anything to do with them. But I want you to notice verse eleven. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. You see, when a person makes a spiritual, intellectual decision to identify with Christ in baptism, that is saying, I am saved, I belong to Christ, and I want to follow with him in his body, his church. I want to grow, and I want to learn. And when that response is there, the arms of the church goes around that person goes around that person and they become very supportive. Now listen, back here. Gentiles were coming into the church and that was causing problems with Jews. Even some of the believing Jews because they had been taught all of their life that you cannot go beyond this barrier. You cannot participate with us. You remember when Peter uh, in Acts chapter uh, 10 went to the house of Cornelius. Chapter 11, what did the church of Jerusalem do with Peter? Reprimanded him. He was not supposed to go to a Gentile. Who sent him to the Gentile? Who sent him to Cornelius' house? God. You do what God wants you to do, okay? If the church frowns on you, you don't leave the church. You help the church to understand where it made a mistake. Are you following me? That's our responsibility, and that's why we have supposed to have leaders in the church to be able to do that. Okay, we'll get to that in a little bit. So, so what, what he's saying, he said, this, this, this love that motivated your, your, your fondness, your, your natural love that now has been sparked with, with a different kind of, of attitude because of your salvation. He says, let that continue. You, you keep on loving your relatives. You keep on loving these Gentiles that are coming in. Okay, That's what he's saying here. Now watch this. He said, uh, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, um, strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unaware. The word angel is a messenger. One day I was talking to somebody and they were really bad-mouthing uh, the Lord. And uh, I said, uh, you need to be careful. Uh, you're a believer, and you're bad mouthed in the Lord. And uh, I said, didn't you know the Bible says you, you better be careful because you might be entertaining angels? And I said, I don't want to. <laughs> you want to talk about getting some negatives? I don't want to. Look at the seven churches of Asia. Unto the angel, the leader of the church of such and such and such and such. Now, if you're a soul winner, you're an angel. You're a messenger. Are you following? See how serious this thing is? So he wants them to know that you're God's person. You're, you're, you belong to Christ. Now, now, you keep this motivation going because you're going to be entertaining. Are you wise enough to know that that person you're talking about or you're criticizing so might be the messenger of God? You see, you go back to Old Testament, we find Abraham, we find others that, that uh, entertain angels unaware. They didn't know they were angels. But today, that has changed because we see the messenger as what? A servant of the Lord. See? And I don't know who I'm talking to. See? So I have to be very careful when I witness and talk to because I don't know who I'm talking to. It might be a preacher and I don't know it. I've had occasions like that when the guy would finally say, well, I'm a preacher and I'm a preacher over so and so. I'm glad I was good. <laughs> and not negative. 
Okay? So this, this is why he's, he's doing this. And so these people have come in. The, these that give us that list in Corinthians that, that were bad people have been changed by the power of the blood of Christ and their commitment now to follow Jesus Christ. He says, you let your love continue for them. Why? Because they're messengers. And if they're not, they might be. You follow me? So, so, so it's a very sensitive thing. He goes on now, he says, Remember them that have the bonds, okay, as bound with them. Now, now what we're talking about here, we're, we're talking about people that are under extreme persecution that are being put in prison, they're being drugged off. A lot of things are happening, okay? And so these people are in bonds, all right. Before I leave off here, uh, in Romans chapter 14, 1 through 10, it says to receive them that are weak in the faith. And, and we do that. If somebody comes into our church and joins our church, they're not 100% Bible knowledge. They have to be taught. And that there's two ways of teaching, verbally and by our actions. Okay? A lot of times our actions have driven people away. The words there, just like somebody said, I hear what you're saying, but your very lifestyle is destroying it. Are you following me? All right, so this is what we're talking about. These people were having extreme hardships. They were under persecution. They were coming and they were dragging them off. They were tossing them into prison and so forth like that. So they had all kinds of problems. Okay. The next one it says, what? This one seems to be out of place. Some of the writers that I've read say, this is out of place. It doesn't belong to Yes, it does. In verse 4, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers will God judge. Let me explain to you what's going on. Go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, you see something very interesting here in verse 10. Verse 10 on down through verse 15, you'll find out that Paul is writing to the church people. And remember, a lot of the situations, the wife might have been saved, the husband has been saved, but the wife has not, or the husband has not. And so he goes along and gives a discourse in that, and he says, if the husband wants to stay with you under your situation, that you're saved and he's not, uh, let it be. That's a good thing. But, but, but if he wants to leave, say, so if he wants to leave, let him go. This is what was happening back here. Under this persecution, the unsaved husband, the unsaved wife, wanted to be under the family. See, there, there's a, when I was a pastor in Oklahoma, a man came to me after I had resigned, and he said, I want to tell you something, Brother Johnson, I never told anybody. He said, the Lord called me to preach. And he said, I got so excited. My wife wasn't with me that day, but he said, I got so excited. The people at the church got excited with me, and I went home, told my wife, and she said, if you do, I'll divorce you. He said, Brother Johnston, I didn't do it. He said, I backed away. And he said, I've paid the fiddler. He said, I've paid the fiddler. He said, God has not left me alone. But he said, I've always said no, 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 to satisfy my wife. You follow me? But then, then he says, to you who are married, stay together. Work it out. Because that's going to be beneficial to your children. So let's take this back now and throw it right in our situation right here. If these people are under persecution and to get away from this pressure, they're going to go back home. The, the wife might be saying, I'm going back home. The husband says, because of my business relationship, I am, I'm going to withdraw from this. I'm not going to take this pressure anymore. i got to have peace in my family. I'm not having it anymore. And so you have a breakdown of the marriage. Where two believers have the Spirit of God working in them 
to counsel, to draw, to develop, and help them. Now, when you have a lost person and a saved person, you don't have that, not unless there's a lot of love on this lost person's heart for their spouse, and that will draw them in. See? So, so you see, when we're talking about this, we have to talk, think more than just what we think normally. We have to put ourselves in the picture and understand what was going on, and a lot of families were literally being torn up in the church because of this same thing. And that's where the writer puts this in there. It says that marriage is honorable. Stick with it. Any preacher I know, I know a lot of preachers that walked out on the Lord because of their marriage. The wife was discontent. My wife says something once in a while, and I'll put her on the spot. She said, if I knew what I knew now, when my husband's trying to preach, I wouldn't let him do it. I said, no, if God called me to preach, I still do it. You see, because there's so much pressure that the wife, that the preacher's family goes under. But the Spirit of God is more powerful than the Spirit in the world, and He can work uh, the whole thing together. Now, Bob already made mention, they did not have the Bible as we have it. This was being written, so we're going to get to that. So here in, in 1 Corinthians, we have to look at that and realize the struggle. So he's telling these, these believers in Christ, no, stick there, bound yourself together, don't be ripped apart, because that's not good for the family. Okay? Now listen, please. A lot of them were breaking away from their wife and, caught, and committing fornication and adultery. Because they're man thing. You follow me? And the wives were doing the very same thing. That's why this is so important to notice. When you're under persecution, when you're under... A lot of people that I know who have left the churches, their marriages have been dissolved. What you find is adultery, fornication, and other things have developed right along with it. You see, folks, I'm not a dummy. I've been around. I know what's going on. I've seen it. I've heard it. I've been involved. I've been trying. I've tried to counsel with some of it. So, so I, when I see this persecution, I understand what's going on, and I understand what's going on today. Okay, because when you get away from the Lord, you're going to start breaking down morals. I don't care how spiritual you think you are. In time, you're going to start breaking those morals down. Watch it. We live in a society right now that people don't get married; they just live together. Believers. Believers. And yes, church members. And there are churches that are accepting that in their church membership. We cannot do that. Well, they say that's legalism. No, that's immoral. That's against God's principles. And if you allow that in, then you're telling our young people this is all right. So go out there, find a guy, and live with it. Come on to church anyhow. We're talking about church members. But we can't do that. And so this is how difficult it becomes. So we're not under persecution. We're doing it freely. Because we have right here the whole word of God to tell us why it's all the way it is. He goes on and he says, the whoremongers and adulterers, God will judge. And I've seen that happen. Then he says, let your conversation be without covetousness. Did you ever look at the picture of the world? When you go back to Genesis and you look at Cain's people, they were very productive very productive in business. Okay? Their number one thing was worldly gain and productivity. And they were doing it. If you really get into it, Noah was a ship builder. He knew what he was doing. God knew what he was doing. He wasn't just some dummy who didn't know how to build a ship. God knew what he was doing. So when you really get into it and, and get into the situation, there was a lot of productivity, there was a lot of activity, there was a lot of businesses going on, but it was all to pacify the flesh. And as you watch that picture go along, you're going to find out that Cain's people influenced 
godly people to where they came right over into it and only one man in his family stood the test. And then there was a preacher, another preacher that stood the test by Enoch. Both of them stood with the Lord. God took Enoch, but he had Noah build a boat and saved him and his family. See, so what I'm saying that there's pictures in the Bible if we're willing to pick ourselves up and put ourselves in it. It's so broad and you see so many things. And that's where Bob says you have to read the Bible, you have to get into it to be able to see these things. Okay? So covetousness here was the desire for wealth, fame, success. Okay? So what does he say? He says, let not I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, let, let, uh, let your conversation be without covetousness. That means your mode of action. Okay? I, did anybody see the series that came out, The Men that, that Made America? It talked about the steel mills, it talked about the railroads, it talked about all that. Did, did you really pay any attention if you saw it? There's two of them that were spiritually motivated until competition came in and spiritual went out the window. Then everything went down the tube. Okay? That's exactly what we're looking at. Does the Lord want us to be productive? Does the Lord want us to be business people? So Yes. But he wants us to follow his dictates. He wants us to follow his directions in all that we do. That's why James talks about uh, the businessmen and how they take care of their employees and so forth like that. So we have a lot in the Word of God that we have to deal with. Now let's go on. He says, be content with such things that you have. Here's people, listen, you have to go over to Nehemiah chapter 5 and see that. Remember, the children of Israel were in captivity in Babylon. God has released them from captivity. They've come back. They're building the, the, the wall. They're building the temple. They're getting everything back. They're building up Jerusalem. And one day, here comes this group of people. Chapter 5, and said, we got a problem. So said, so we've come out of bondage. We, we, we borrowed money over there, we paid it off and everything. And, and we've come here and now we've had to sell our land and everything. And, and our nobles and so forth are putting us in a strait because they're charging us interest and they're putting our families in bondage, otherwise servitude, until we pay off our loans. Nehemiah got all upset. And boy, he went to these people and said, you get this thing straight right now. You relieve these people and you give their money back to them. Because the Bible says the Jew is not supposed to charge usury. Okay. Yes, they could take a family into captivity until they paid off that debt. But this situation was survival. And so these nobles were looking for the money. Do you know it's just the other night there came a news deal on TV that they have two hundred and some million dollars that they have consecrated, have got away from these uh, groups during COVID, uh, rescue, send in your money and we'll make sure this goes to the right sources and so like that. 200 and some, $268 million that they have gotten that were gotten wrongfully, just to put it in people's pockets. You see how the human race, listen, you're no different. If it comes to a survival mode, are you going to think about godly things? Or are you going to think to pacify your flesh? Are, are you following me? Okay. Uh, you go. Johnson, if a believer will take this verse and take it seriously and live their life the way they're supposed to, these people will see Christ. Sure, sure. That's the whole point. Yeah, that's the whole point. Mm -hmm. We're supposed to live that way and show them that we've got something better. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so they were doing this under the street. Now let's go on. Now here's what I like. In these verses, we're going to see a double negative that's producing a positive. That's where, like Bob says, we need to know the Bible. Preachers need to know this. Here it says, for he, God, 
has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. The double negative is, I will never, I will never. Now the first one, it says, I will never, I will never leave thee. The second one says, I will never, I will never, I will never forsake you. Why, why is that there? Ours is a, is a positive. Here you have three negatives. Repeat, repeat, because God wants us to know that he is able. No matter what is it, what it is, in extreme situations, he's still able. My wife and I can vouch for that. We've seen it happen. We, we didn't have, she said, I don't know what we're going to have for supper. I was in school. She was working. She wasn't going to get a paycheck. This is, I, I think, on Tuesday. I went to school and I didn't know. We had children. I didn't know. And there was a truck that came down out of the northern part of Arkansas down there and they took a whole bunch of groceries into the, into the school and I helped them unload it. I was too proud to use the pantry at the school. And there was a big box right up in the front of that cab of that pickup truck. And um, the guy said, leave it alone. That belongs, that's designated. That doesn't go inside. So I finished up and I went home to change to go to work. Here came that pickup truck. Back to my driveway. Bill said, this is for you. I don't want to tell you that at school, but this has been designated for you. Who's watching out for us? Amen. We've seen these things many, many times. God is able. Okay, now I want to deal with this real quickly. He goes on and he says, Remember them that have the rule over you. Now look at verse 17. Obey them that have the rule over you, for they submit themselves, uh, and submit yourself, for they watch for your souls as if they must give an account. What these preachers were doing is they were giving the people the positives, and they were giving them the negatives. This is what the Lord expects us to do. Keep on loving one another. Keep on supporting one another. Keep on doing these things that I've listed here. Okay? Keep on doing these things. And, 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 and then he said, this is what the preacher's doing. He said, now, if you stop doing that, you're not only going to hurt. The testimony of Christ is going to hurt. Did you know a lot of preachers are preaching their sermons today? They're not on their knees praying to God to preach his sermons. Because there are so many things that we need to be aware of in our world today, and we're not hearing it. We don't know how to handle it. That's supposed to come from the pulpit, supposed to come from the, from the lecture stand. We're supposed to hear things to help us to adjust as we're going through. We're dealing with the gays, and a lot of the young people now are adapting to the gays. That they need to know and understand what God says about all of this so they can make right decisions. Are you following me? So, so we have to be very careful. But he goes on and says, now watch this. He says, who has spoken the word, spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith followed. They've died. A lot of them have died through persecution, but their faith right to the end. They put their faith right to the end for the people's sake. For the people's sake. And now it's this. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and today and forever. What in the world is he telling us here that Jesus is the same? What he wants us to understand, Jesus never changed his mind. You go to John chapter 16, verse 33. He said, be of good cheer. I've overcome. How do you overcome? Death. You overcome when you die. What happens between, between now and then? Is your faith going to be destroyed? Are you going to turn against Christ? No. Christ is always there. He never, never, never changes. And then he says, be not, see, be not carried away with every divers of strange, uh, divers and strange doctrines.
Divers means that some people will leave the church and they'll dive in a tavern, dive, dive in somebody else's wife's arms. <laughs> and I was trying to make a point. But he says here, divers and strange teachings that were contrary to the Lord. And folks, there are so many divers and strange teachings today that we need to be aware of. Any comment? We're out of time. I hope I've given you something on this last chapter to help you understand what the whole book is about. Okay. Next week we'll start a brand new study. Okay. With the